Welcome back to the New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com, living in the age of rage. We've got that story plus slaying the patent trolls. But first, back on December 6th, 2017, America's next top president announced the United States recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and ordered the relocation of the U.S. embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. The new embassy officially opened Monday, May 14th, coinciding with the 70th anniversary of the Israeli Declaration of Independence. It's also the new moon and the start of Ramadan, and the IDF took it upon themselves, meanwhile, to kill some 60 protesters as part of this celebration. It's a massacre. World cries high death toll in Gaza protests. The deadly outcome of protests in Gaza against the U.S. relocation of its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem caused widespread condemnations from around the world with calls on Israel to use more restraint against Palestinians. The U.N.'s top human rights official, Zaid Ra'ad al-Hussein, took to Twitter to decry the shocking killing of dozens, injury of hundreds by Israeli live fire, adding that the right to life must be respected. Saudi Arabia condemned the targeting of unarmed Palestinians in a statement from its foreign ministry, while Qatar decried the brutal massacre and systematic killing committed by the Israeli occupation forces. Finally, Israel's arch enemies, Hezbollah and Iran, slammed Israel for the Gaza violence with Syria's foreign ministry also protesting the brutal massacre. Now, that last sentence there may have kind of betrayed where that's coming from. But interestingly enough, that article comes from Haaretz with the title, It's a Massacre, World Decries High Death Toll in Gaza Protests. I think it kind of shows that the outcry and the backlash about this has kind of been bad enough for at least, you know, kind of feign interest in the Israeli press without a shred of irony, including the Saudis and the Brits and the rest of the worldwide killers. James? That's right. And actually, that headline and that that article from um, Haaretz is much further than any of the American mainstream outlets went or have gone so far um, in terms of reporting on this. And just for the examples of that, I'll direct people over to uh, Joe Loria's recent article on U.S. media whitewashes Gaza massacre. And just some of the examples they have in there, all of these passive tense, uh, you know, 50 people have died 2,400 have been, people have been injured in pro- clashes on the border, which of course is just meaningless fluff phrases to completely take out any actual subjectivity of who did what to whom here, what's going on. If you're just reading the headlines, you're obviously getting no information whatsoever. So that's a really good article breaking that down. And just to add uh, the latest in the diplomatic developments on this, uh, coming from antiwar.com, U.S. blocks U.N. probe into Gaza deaths. The United States has used its veto power at the U.N. Security Council to block a Monday resolution calling for an independent probe into the killing of scores of Palestinian protesters this week along the Gaza Strip border. The protesters were killed by Israeli forces. And that is the simple way of putting it. The protesters were killed. The unarmed protesters were killed by Israeli forces. But, of course, Israel is trying to spin it. They were all Hamas agents, and this is all a big Hamas plot. And it's Hamas's fault that we're killing un- 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 unarmed protesters, which is absurd and ludicrous on its face. But just to demonstrate that, in case there are any in this crowd or any people that in, uh, in this crowd who know people who are going along with that type of line, just imagine, just do the little thought experiment, if this was, say, Syrian army kills 50, uh, mows down 2,400 uh, casualties in a single day of protests in Syria, what do you think the international response would be? What do you think, how do you think that would be covered in the U.S. media? Would it be covered in this way? Of course it would not. That That is a cl- crystal clear uh, way of, of understanding the lens through which this is being portrayed. It is a massacre. Uh, what is happening is absolutely a war crime. And now that the U.S. is bl- actively blocking any type of, even an independent probe into what happened, uh, they are now complicit in that war crime. No surprise there, par for the course. And, of course, this all relates to the Great March of Return, which is this ongoing protest movement. It's not just about the embassy, or at least not just focused on that. This is a big six-week-long thing that's that's been going on and building steam and involves a lot of people um, who are not Hamas and are not terrorists, literally unarmed civilians who are being mown down in cold blood, and including journalists now. Uh, a couple of reports of, uh, I think, seven journalists were injured the other day being shot by Israeli um, 
uh, officers. So this is what's happening, and uh, very few outlets in the U.S. are going to be reporting on it. I played some of the celebrations and the speeches and all the bloviating on the White House YouTube channel. Just played the audio of some of that on the stream, and it's pretty difficult to stomach. Kurt Nemo recently wrote an article pointing out also, as as we, I think, have pointed out in the past here on Neural Next Week, that Trump's role in this and his sort of Zionist flip-flop is not at all a surprise if you were looking at where the funding was coming as the whole lead up to America's next top president show. James, I've got a really very media monarchy style related story to this that I came across and just trying to find some kind of related, you know, subtext and context to this story. This came up when I searched Gaza massacre. Of course, there was no shortage of search results going back to all kinds of times. Gaza massacre film in earns rave reviews at the Cannes Film Festival, which is going on right now. A devastating film about the massacre of an extended Palestinian family in Gaza by Israeli forces in 2009 has been hailed by critics at the Cannes Film Festival. Italian filmmaker Stefano Savona spent nine years trying to piece together what happened when a farming community in the north of the Gaza Strip was razed by Israeli special forces, killing 29 civilians mostly huddled together in one house. Samuni Road, that's called, uses animation and 3D images to reconstruct what happened and bring alive the ghosts of the victims. It's got rave reviews with one critic calling it an anti-war film for the ages. Art imitates life, imitates politics. Which brings us to our second segment here on the long-awaited return of New World Next Week. It's episode 339 for those keeping score in our break, as we told you at the end of the last episode. I moved, Brock moved, and James had a little bit of a vacation as well. So our second segment here on New World Next Week, episode 339, the musical question from The Guardian, are we living in the 50-year rage cycle? This is a pretty interesting article on The Guardian kind of filed under psychology, and it's a long piece, and I've kind of drilled it down. And again, we'll always remind you that everything that we say and play will always be included in the show notes. From passive-aggressive notes on ambulance windscreens to bilious political discourse, it feels as though society is suddenly consumed by fury. What's to blame for this outpouring of aggression? Does any of this have any wider social meaning? Does it place us at a perilous point on the curve of history, on the tinderbox of a grand explosion? Or is it that some things... Cars, social media are just really bad for our mental health. There's a discipline known as Clio Dynamics from Clio, the muse of history, and Dynamics, the study of why things change with time, developed at the start of this century. So pretty fresh new discipline by scientist Peter Turchin, which plots historical events by a series of mathematical measures. These measures yield a map of history in which you see spikes of rage roughly every 50 years. 1870, 1920, 1970, you have to allow a little wiggle room to take in the First World War and, of course, the very violent year of 1968. Cycles of violence are not always unproductive. They take in civil rights, union, and suffragette movements. Indeed, as The Guardian writes, all social movements of consequence start with unrest, whether in the form of strike action, protest, or riot. Some situate economics at the heart of the social mood. The Kondratiev wave, which lasts between 40 and 60 years, and if you call it 50, it corresponds neatly with this cycle of violence. The Kondratiev wave describes the modern world economy in cycles of high and low growth, where stagnation always corresponds with unrest. David Andress, just one of the numerous kind of thinkers and writers and psychologists that they consult in this article. David Andress is a professor of history at the University of Portsmouth and the author of Cultural Dementia, How the Slash and Burn Rage of the Present Political Climate is Made Possible Only by Willfully Forgetting the Past. The article goes on. I think that's a great place to kind of stop and ponder that nugget. The slash and burn rage of the present political climate is made possible only by willfully forgetting the past. James, I think that's exactly why so many on the fake left have been raging for their last year and a half. And it's the same exact kind of rage the phony right had when Obama was pushing all their buttons. James? Yes, despite the fact that this is on The Guardian, it is actually worth reading. There are certain nuggets in here that are worth contemplating that have been articulated before. This is nothing startlingly new, but I think this is a good window into the, the whole 
I guess, cleodynamic field of study, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, we've talked about this in various aspects in our work before, the fourth turning and that sort of thing, but there, there clearly are cycles to history and there are movements of rising and falling tensions and economic cycles and these sorts of things. So there's definitely something here. And this article goes on to make the point about how technology and social media are feeding into the rage cycle and changing the dynamics of how people express and even ultimately end up feeling their rage because uh, there's the the prospect at least of sort of rage contagion that uh, the, these these emotions that are now e very easy to express in to millions of people around the world many of whom most of whom you've never even met and never will that that can actually spread these types of I guess mimetic in a mimetic fashion these 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 emotions and uh, rage being one of the ones that taps into people's psyches in a particularly effective way so there is definitely some meat on these bones here of this article um, and the, the issues that it's talking about. And it raises the fundamental question of our age, which is what I see crystal clear happening in real time. And I'm watching it develop is the, the, the complete polarization of society. If you are not one of us, you are one of them. And it's generally, you know, if you're, oh, you're one of those leftist snowflake SJW commie libtards, or you're a fascist right wing, worse than literally Hitler. And there's less and less ground for anything not even in between that, but that straddles the kind of left and right or that that doesn't play those left-right politics. And increasingly, people are forced to choose sides because it is literally, if you are not one of us, you are one of them. You are the enemy. And there is a valid, a very real question about how is there anything we can do to put the put the brakes on that process of polarization or, or to, to break that cycle? And that's really the question. To what extent are these cycles of history uh, uh, determinative? And to what extent do we have subjective uh, ability to influence that and shape it and put it in a different direction? Obviously, I believe that history is not deterministic and it's not that we are fated and we cannot avoid these cycles. But the question is, how do we influence it? How do we take the momentum and the energy and the, the technologies and everything that's coming together at this point in time to move it in a different direction? It's kind of like a freight train barreling down the tracks. You can't stop it, but you can direct it in different ways. And uh, I think that's that's what we all have to come together to try to do. And I, that's the type of uh, discussion I'd love to foster, but fostering that discussion online is almost I impossible because of the trolls and the, the rage and all of those things that play into it. So it's a huge issue. And this is a good article for at least directing people into that issue and starting to get to think about some of these issues. But I don't want to give The Guardian clicks. So let's let's link to the archive.is saved version of this so that you don't have to actually click onto The Guardian servers to read this article. I, I double-checked, James, just, just to see if it was all kind of coming together as, as we've talked about. The new fourth installment of The Purge movie series will, will be out this summer, just, just right on time for, for The Rage. And let's remind people that we've talked about The Purge in the past on my Film Literature and New World Order podcast, so we'll throw that link in so people can hear our discussion about that and how that uh, reflects and feeds into the, the cycles of violence of our time. Because those have been, yeah, I mean, they've been, and and again, this is just kind of one little small data point that I've kind of, you know, hooked into. It's just one small point that they've been making those films for several years, longer than our sort of two-year extra kind of rage peak that we're in right now. We will include some nerdy notes on Cleodynamics and the Kondratiev wave in the show notes. And we'll wrap up our third and final segment with an easy good news story. The EFF wins flawless victory over podcasting patent troll. Back in early 2013, a patent troll called Personal Audio LLC had sued comedian Adam Carolla and was threatening a bunch of other smaller podcasters. Personal Audio LLC claimed that podcasters infringed U.S. Patent 8112504 which claims a, quote, system for disseminating media content, end quote, in serialized episodes. The Electronic Frontier Foundation challenged the podcasting patent at the patent office in October 2013 and won that proceeding, and it was affirmed on appeal. This week, the Supreme Court, as they've been doling out some decisions, rejected personal audios. Petition for review. The case is finally over. 
Meanwhile, Adam Carolla actually fought personal audio in federal court in the Eastern District of Texas. He raised money for his defense and was eventually able to convince personal audio to actually walk away. Now, James, I'll just say, as long as we're talking about Adams and podcast, we all know it's Adam Curry, who, if anybody owns the podcast, it's the man who coined the word podcast. Now, I'm, I'm being sarcastic and facetious, but this is a little bit of good news, so we'll take it. Absolutely, we will. And I think that this is the decision the courts had to make. They could not have made any other decision here, because even if they did, there is no way that they could have enforced it. If suddenly, oh, okay, there is this patent, and everyone who puts out uh, episodes on the web in a serialized fashion now owes money to this, this corporation because they have the patent on that idea. It's so on its face stupid that no one would go along with that. No one would think that's a good idea. So I think this is the obvious answer that the courts had to come up with. But it does, for the more curious in the intellectual sorts out there, it does raise the question about patents and about intellectual property. And I'd like to think that a lot of our audience already know, has thought about and knows about these issues. But if not, this is a great time to introduce people to people like Stefan Kinsella, who has done excellent work talking about intellectual property and really drilling down on the bare bones basics of why it is completely fraudulent on every level. Even if you take the utilitarian approach, well, yeah, but it helps to foster creativity and there, there has to be an incentive and reward for people to blah, blah, blah. Actually, no. When you actually look at the actual scientific research that has been done on this, no, actually, it is more of a drain on productivity and, and creativity than it is a boon. And again, I won't attempt to articulate all that. I'll just direct people over to Stefan Kinsella. He has the Kinsella on Liberty podcast, which I recommend. And if you're just dipping your toe into the subject, I'd recommend just going through his archives and just listening to the various debates that he's been in with people arguing about intellectual property and the validity of that concept. And I, for one, have never heard a debate where anyone has even made a point that landed against Kinsella, let alone won the debate overall. Every single time he knocks down their facetious, fallacious arguments um, with with cold, hard facts. So it's uh, this is an extremely important subject, the overall subject of intellectual property. Should patents exist at all? Should copyright? Should trademark? Why? In what circumstances? I'd just like people to, to think a little bit more about this, because this is a good window into that to show this is the stupidest thing. Some corporation owns the idea of serializing episodes into a podcast? Of course not. But wait, so what, what podcasts, or what patents are valid and, and, and why? So I'll, I'll just direct people over to Kinsella on Liberty. James, I was, you remind me, I was reading last year, the, the title of which escapes me. I'll get it and get it correctly and put it in the show notes. I was reading, I had a promo copy of a book last year that was about the Aaron Schwartz story where he's, of course, illegally copying freely available material. The interesting part of the book is it's all prefaced by the whole beginning of Daniel Webster and the whole beginning of kind of the whole idea of copyright. So in closing, James, I'll just note that I stream news, music, memes, and more Monday through Friday at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. The room is still kind of surrounded by boxes, but I've got all the gear up and rolling after the whole moving the monarchy. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, getting back to our regular schedule, and I hope everyone else is too. Of course, they can follow you at MediaMonarchy.com and follow me at CorbettReport.com. Until next week, stay tuned.